I am really excited to be here today to do our panel on the third era of currency, how internet mathematics and Bitcoin are innovating money. We have a fabulous expert panel here who I expect to do most of the talking. Uh, to start with, we've got Ed Felton, who is a very distinguished professor of uh, public policy and computer science at Princeton University. We have Jerry Brito, a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Susan Atherton, who is a AD. professor of... Hmm? AD. Oh gosh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> See, well, I've already messed up once, guys, so... Oh. The rest of it's going to be fine. Uh, Susan Athey, who is a professor of economics at Stanford her, uh, Graduate School of Business. Uh, Patrick Merck, who is the general counsel for the Bitcoin Foundation. And John Collins, who is a professional staff member at the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Government Affairs. Uh, so we've also picked a particularly auspicious time to have this particular panel, considering the news that a prominent Bitcoin startup CEO has recently been charged with money laundering. So without too much further ado, I'm going to go ahead and let everybody get started by telling us a little bit about themselves, their perspective on Bitcoin, and we can get on to questions from myself and from the audience. Uh, Ed, would you mind starting us off? Thanks. Thanks. Um, so I have studied the uh, Bitcoin from a technology standpoint, as well as how the technology connects to uh, economics and to the community aspects of the Bitcoin as a system. Um, and uh, that's a really rich topic, but I want to talk in, right now just about two things. Um, and really the two questions that I think I get the most about Bitcoin. One is, is it really anonymous? And the second is, if it's a decentralized system with nobody in charge, how does it actually work without breaking down into chaos? So first, the anonymity question. Um, compared to older arrangements um, related to money and payments, uh, Bitcoin is in some ways more traceable and in other ways less traceable. Uh, when I say it's more traceable, um, that's because every single transfer of value in the Bitcoin system is written into a public ledger. If it's not in the ledger, then it's not a valid transfer. So you can see everything that happens. And so if there's a pattern of a money movement that looks like money laundering, it's right there in the public ledger. Everyone can see it. So every transfer is visible. Um, on the other hand, the transfers are to and from um, not identified individuals, but pseudonymous um, so-called Bitcoin addresses, which you can think of as like wallets uh, that can hold value. Uh, and so although you can see that there is a transaction, it's not written right on the face of the transaction in the public ledger exactly who that is. On the other hand, if you are in the uh, business of investigating and following the money, uh, you can follow the money through the Bitcoin system. And if you can follow the money in and out through the transfers, say, to buy and sell Bitcoins for currency, then, um, then you actually have perhaps a greater investigative capability than you might have had otherwise. So when it comes to anonymity, it's a complicated question. Um, and we still don't know exactly uh, whether it's more or less susceptible to tracing and identification of participants than traditional currencies. The second question is, um, and, and this gets to one of the hardest things to understand about Bitcoin, which is that um, it really, first it really is true that there is no central issuer of Bitcoins. There's no central authority who decides how things are going to work. So if that's the case, how come it doesn't just descend into chaos? How can you have a currency with no one issuing it and no one in charge and have anything sensible happen? Um, and the answer really is um, uh, get straight to the brilliant um, bit of technical design that's at the core of Bitcoin. Um, and that is a way of designing a system in which the parties can come to consensus about important matters and where especially the incentives tend to drive the parties <coughs> toward consensus. So there are really three forms of consensus that Bitcoin is built on. The first is a consensus about what the rules of the system are, which kinds of transactions are valid, who can do a transaction, and so on. What, are the, what is everything supposed to look like? Um, so there's a consensus about what the rules are. There's a consensus as well about which transfers of value have actually happened and which have not, who owns which Bitcoins, and how did they get there. And then the third piece of consensus is the usual consensus for a currency, a consensus that this thing has value and that people are likely to accept it in payment in the future. 
So the real cleverness in the Bitcoin design, and, and this goes way beyond what I could possibly do in the limited time here, is that it creates an incentive that pushes people toward maintaining the, these forms of consensus. So that once people have agreed on what the rules of the Bitcoin system are supposed to be, that the incentive is to continue to comply with those rules. And any evolution or change in the rules can happen due to a change in the consensus of the participants and really in no other way. The consequence of this is really uh, challenging and interesting if you're involved in regulation or, uh, or rulemaking, lawmaking generally. What that means is that Bitcoin is not a thing you can call up and, and, talk, and talk to. Um, it exists as a consensus. Um, you can certainly regulate or enforce the law against individual participants in the Bitcoin ecosystem. But if any government or any party or anyone here, uh, even the general counsel of the Bitcoin Foundation, wants to change the rules of Bitcoin, they have only the power of persuasion. Um, and that makes it an interesting system, a very interesting system, and a new kind of thing that our regulatory system has not dealt with before. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jerry. All right, well, so I've been focused on the intersection of Bitcoin and regulation. And so to date, that has meant uh, anti-money laundering uh, laws, Bank Secrecy Act, and money transmission laws. Um, and when Andre told me that, uh, Today, we'd have three to five minutes uh, to sort of make an opening remark. I thought I'd tell you about what uh, my research will be in the future, which is um, Bitcoin and derivatives uh, regulation. But um, events transpired, uh, and I thought that I would first address, or just try to sort of address um, uh, the 800 pound uh, gorilla in the room. Um, and I'll do that by saying this, uh, that Bitcoin took off very quickly. Um, and it exploded uh, from a system that had just one or two users and uh, Bitcoin was worth a penny or less uh, to something that today has tens of thousands of users and uh, Bitcoin is worth about $900. And that happened in the span of uh, five years. Um, and in that meantime, what you had is people who really drove that growth, as we see in so many disruptive technologies when they were first introduced, is that it was hobbyists and enthusiasts uh, who really drove that, uh, who really were, were, the, were the folks there at the beginning driving the development and the innovation. And um, these were very young people oftentimes and um, very technically savvy, but perhaps not very sophisticated when it comes to other things like regulation. And these people uh, were the first to build out the infrastructure around Bitcoin, the exchanges um, that were necessary, um, the first wallet services. And they found themselves, first of all, millionaires uh, very quickly. Um, and they also found themselves all of a sudden at the center of a very highly regulated industry um, with little experience to match that. Um, so they created the first generation of startups that laid down the infrastructure. Um, and so you had, for example, whenever people talk about the price of Bitcoin, they'll often refer to the price at Mt. Gox. And Mt. Gox, for a very long time, for probably the majority of Bitcoin's five-year history, was the biggest exchange. Um, uh, last year, Mt. Gox uh, had a, over a million dollars, I think, seized um, by the federal government um, because they were not complying with money uh, transmission rules. Um, and... Uh, <clears throat> so a lot of these first-generation companies were not uh, complying. Yesterday, we saw the arrest of Charlie Shrem, uh, who was also uh, CEO of an exchange that operated for an early part of, of Bitcoin's history. Um, and so I'm not saying this to excuse uh, their non-compliance, um, but to point out that there is now a second generation. And this is, again, something that we see in disruptive technologies when they're introduced. Uh, at some point... Um, the enthusiasts and the technologists uh, and the hobbyists who built the foundation of the technology um, uh, sort of hand off the baton to professionals who come in um, and further build out the system. So today we have, again, a second generation that, uh, that is building out the Bitcoin infrastructure, and this is led by serious entrepreneurs and seasoned financial industry uh, veterans. Um, and they understand their compliance obligations. Um, and the reason I say this is uh, that I hope we don't judge the second generation 
based on the actions of some of the folks in the first generation of Bitcoin businesses. And certainly, we shouldn't be judging the technology itself because the technology is neutral. Um, so that's what I want to say about that. Uh, and to briefly just talk about uh, Bitcoin and derivatives, why am I thinking about that? Um, it's a few things. First is the, uh, the price of Bitcoin is very volatile. Uh, it's, it's very volatile, um, mostly, I think, because it is a very thinly traded uh, currency or commodity or whatever it is. Um, and something that would uh, truly help uh, tame that volatility would be a futures market in Bitcoin. And indeed, um, there are many companies around the Bitcoin ecosystem who, who are building out, for example, merchant services, um, who accept a lot of volatility risk when they provide merchant services to merchants, um, who would like to see a futures market in Bitcoin. And so if that ever does come to pass, uh, we'll probably see CFTC uh, and SEC involvement. Um, and that comes from, you know, should there be, you know, are there over-the-counter contracts, you know, between two counterparties? And if so, um, at what point does that have to go through a clearinghouse? What about exchange-traded um, uh, futures? Uh, today, we already see um, some uh, companies trying to develop these products, for example, Coinsetter. Um, then you also have, sort of separate from that, the case that today there are um, futures markets operating that operate only accepting Bitcoin, if that makes sense, right? So you can, you, you can, you can um, short Bitcoin using Bitcoin. Um, and, and so how, you know, how does uh, re the regulation that we have today apply to markets that only uh, operate using Bitcoin? And by the way, a lot of those markets, so for example, Predictious is one of them, um, they operate as prediction markets. So the futures that they offer are not just on commodities and financial instruments, but they are prediction markets, right? So what's the weather going to be like tomorrow? Who's going to win the Super Bowl? And that is something that the CFTC today has been very hostile to. And then finally, um, you have the prospect of decentralized futures markets. Now, this is a little hard to wrap your head around, but you can imagine um, a system where you can um, make a bet um, uh, on a future event, uh, whether it's price of a commodity or a security or a Super Bowl or anything else, with no intermediary setting up that transaction and nobody is. Uh, Ed was saying that you could call up and regulate. And so it's going to be very interesting to see um, how that develops. So I'll stop there. Great, thanks. So maybe I'll start by picking up from the discussion of sort of the early enthusiasts of Bitcoin uh, by way of an analogy with uh, eBay. So when you think about the early days of eBay, uh, a lot of people were doing things like auctioning Beanie Babies and, you know, obsession with the Beanie Babies uh, helped get a platform off the ground that could really only operate effectively if it had lots of people interested and engaged. Once it got off the ground, it became so much more than Beanie Babies. It was a platform for entrepreneurship and then later with the acquisition of PayPal, also providing payment services that enabled new forms of electronic commerce to occur that had not been occurring in the past. And of course, PayPal also opened up a lot of things that we just couldn't do before. If, if somebody dies and you want to set up a memorial fund as an individual, if someone has cancer, if your school has a fundraiser, um, your friend is doing a, a walk for leukemia, they're going to be raising money um, and getting small payments from their friends using PayPal. And a lot of those types of things just wouldn't have happened without that new service to come in that served sort of unmet needs. So I think if you, if you now turn to think about the early days of Bitcoin, we had various things that got people very enthusiastic. There was the technology and the cryptography. Um, there were dark things like Silk Road, um, Satoshi Dice and gambling. And, and then in the last year, we've seen people very excited just about betting on it, making money, speculating on the currency. I buy it at 200, I sell it at 500. The market cap is going up. Um, you see it in the newspaper, and that gets lots of people interested. And, and all of that interest helps fuel the, in, the in engagement in the system. It, it fuels the interest of venture capitalists, and it's also brought on much needed engagement by regulators to try to create a framework for this, for this industry. Okay, but in some sense, the fact that there were Beanie Babies or there was Satoshi Dice is sort of irrelevant for the, the future of this technology. 
So, so what is the technology and, and why, why is it interesting um, and why do I think personally that it may really be transformative for financial services uh, over the next 10 to 20 years? Well, you know, again, people have been focusing on Bitcoin for illegal activities or a store of value, but it's really fundamentally a, a really cool technology. It's a public ledger. Okay, a secure public ledger that uses cryptography to make sure that only the owner of an address can authorize sending something to another address. Okay? So that's like fundamentally the technology. I can send something to you, and only me, the owner of the thing, is authorized to send it to you, and instantly, securely, publicly, we now know that you have that chit instead of me. Okay? That enables all sorts of things. That's the basic technology. In some sense, we, we could have known how to do this for a long time. There were a lot of details, but now we've kind of seen the power of this. So if that's the description, what does this have to do with currency? You know, why, why do we even need a currency? What has a ledger got to do with that? Well, the thing that's on the ledger in Bitcoin is the Bitcoin. That's the thing that moves from me to you. I have point one, I send it to you, now you have point one. What is the thing? We call it a Bitcoin. Okay, we, can, we have to have something on that ledger. Now you might ask, well, why not just put dollars on that ledger? Why not have a ledger that keeps track of who has dollars? But of course, I can't physically beam a dollar from me to you. Okay, wh whereas this protocol can keep track of entries in a ledger um, without having to worry about dollars. Now some of the, the, the next generation um, virtual currency protocols, like I'm advising a company called Ripple that has one of these protocols, actually allows you to keep stores of anything on the ledger. You can make up your own new currency and enter it on the ledger. You could use airline miles. You can put dollars on the ledger. But one key difference between the native currency of the ledger and some other currency is that if I have a dollar on the ledger, there's not literally a dollar on that ledger. There must be some financial institution who's promising to give me a dollar if I ask for it. And that financial institution is then plugged into the ledger. And so it, and I still have a counterparty. I still have somebody I'm trusting to give me the dollar back. And if the institution that I'm working with to keep my dollar on the ledger goes under, my dollar is gone. While with, with Bitcoin or XRP, which is the native currency of the Ripple protocol, it's only the protocol. There's no other person. Now, the whole protocol could somehow blow up, but as long as the protocol is functioning, there's no individual that I'm having to trust to give me my unit of value. I can just send it from one to another. Okay? So, this is a, so that's why this ledger actually involves a currency um, instead of just the dollar. Okay, so now that we, but now that we have a, a ledger, what can we do with it? What, what, why is this going to be transformative? So I think there's sort of a couple of categories to think about. There's sort of new forms of electronic commerce. So in the United States, if you think about it, like why are apps, you know, apps are like a dollar or two dollars. They're not 25 cents. That's basically because the fees sort of make it uneconomical to make small transactions. All of our newspapers, which are struggling to get revenue, they can't sell an individual article for a penny. Okay? Well, there's lots of types of small value transactions that we might like to do, but they can't really be done using dollars. Now, you, what you'll see, you'll see companies do if they want to make a lot of these transactions is introduce point systems or things like that so, they, so that they're kind of, say, Xbox Live points or something like that, right? Those point systems allow you to make small transactions without coming into your credit card over and over again and incurring fees. And so you have seen in situations like that, that that new innovations have had to occur. And what I think about Bitcoin and other virtual currencies is sort of doing that on a universal scale rather than having to keep track of points and all sorts of different systems for every online service you want to use. Instead, there's an ability to do that sort of universally. Um, other types of things that, that are enabled, just like the fundraisers that PayPal enabled, um, are things like uh, cross-border transactions. So uh, being able to do electronic commerce, say, to individuals who provide low-value services, whether it's language tutoring or handmade arts and crafts internationally, where today the middlemen would take a bunch of the, of the cut because there's just very difficult to move the money across borders. Remittances is another big thing. In many developing countries, about a third of their GDP comes at, from remittances. People go abroad and work in countries like the United States 
states, or you also see this in the Gulf region, um, people sending money back to African countries and so on. A lot of money is flowing back, and these people are going away from their families, working 70 or 80 hours a week, making their money to try to send it back home, and the fees that they're paying are a high fraction of that. If they have an emergency and need to get the money home the same day to buy food for their children, they might pay up to 20 percent um, to get the money home uh, if, if it's a small dollar amount that they're sending. So the, now it's not that I, I think that all people in developing countries should be holding large balances of a risky asset like Bitcoin, but rather if you have, you, it enables a new form of financial services to come to operate, it, it facilitates entry and by cutting out a lot of the frictions, it can allow people to provide those services at lower cost and increase competition. Um, so there, there's, there's other types of things. We probably haven't even thought of all of the uses that would be enabled by this. You can think about escrow. There, how, how, how many times do we need a middleman to hold on to something because we can't verify you know, that, that a transaction is occurring simultaneously from escrow services, title services, all sorts of things. So if you have this secure public ledger, there are possibly new innovations that will come into play that, that, that none of us here have even imagined. So overall, I think this is a really exciting new development. Um, for those of, those of you who are thinking about this from the regulatory and policy perspective, the, the big cautionary note I would sound is that if we don't come up with a good regulatory regime in the United States that allows innovation to occur, this will all occur offshore. All the big exchanges are you know, in Slovenia, in Japan, other places. And if they're offshore, we're going to have less control over them and again, if you're outside of the compliance regime, you're going to have a hard time getting high quality people to advise you. You're going to have a hard time getting high quality banks who have great infrastructure that can advise you and so on. And so the sooner and better we do at regulating this and allowing major US institutions to participate, the more the institutions will evolve to be compliant with the desires and goals of the overall um, banking regulatory regime in the United States. And so I see a lot of positive signs that that may happen, um, but there's also a lot of ways we could mess it up. Um, and so I'm hoping to see the regulatory regime evolve so that the really talented people we have in Silicon Valley and the really talented people we have in U.S. banks are able to participate in shaping this in a way that enhances the U.S. Natural and national interest rather than um, harms it. Thank you, Susan. And Patrick? Hi. Um, so uh, my name is Patrick Merck. I'm general counsel of the Bitcoin Foundation. Uh, and since we're talking about elephants in the room, we should just get this out of the way, too. So uh, the uh, person alluded to earlier, uh, Charlie, who was uh, arrested yesterday, uh, served on the board of directors of the Bitcoin Foundation. Um, to Charlie's credit, he always puts Bitcoin first, and he did here as well, and he resigned uh, almost immediately. Uh, as soon as he was able. So, um, you know, best wishes to Charlie as he uh, goes forward on in his case. And we should all keep in mind that these are allegations um, and not convictions. Um, so uh, it does raise, though, this idea that um, <clears throat> in the early days, as Jerry alluded to, there was something I used to call Bitcoin magical thinking that existed. This idea that Bitcoin was unregulated because there was no third party there and there was no specific regulation that said, well, Bitcoin is money or Bitcoin makes you a securities uh, broker or dealer or something like that. And people would build these systems and say, well, I've built a distributed stock exchange and of course I'm not a broker dealer because Bitcoin, right? And it's got these magical properties that somehow I'm no longer, I'm, I'm not regulated or what I'm doing <coughs> isn't illegal. And of course it wasn't true then, it isn't true now. Um, and people have learned that. And I think to a large degree it's because it was driven by hobbyists and, and people who are younger and, and less experienced and didn't really understand how regulations work, how financial markets and regulators work together, and the consequences of operating an unregulated business. Um, I think at this point in time, it would be really hard for any sane person to look at this space and think to themselves, well, Bitcoin is unregulated. Well, it was never unregulated. It's certainly regulated. And from the moment I first saw Bitcoin and thought of it and, and, and looked at this technology, you know, back in 2010, I, I said to myself, you know, this is really neat. And there's some definitely some interesting uh, regulatory aspects to this. But, you know, this is one of the most regulated technologies that's, that's out there right now. 
you are immediately into the financial services world. You're a money services business, you're a money transmitter, you're a securities broker dealer. These are highly, highly regulated industries, and Bitcoin is a highly regulated space. And now that we're seeing the second wave of kind of entrepreneurship and you're seeing the experts and the entrepreneurs who really know what they're doing uh, and getting good sound advice, you're seeing very compliant companies being built up around the space. And you know that's a good thing. It's evolutionary and these things happen. Um, so I'd like to now shift and talk about happier things, um, like how Bitcoin is going to really improve uh, uh, the consumer experience in e-commerce. Um, so one thing to think about in Bitcoin is how it's developing in waves. So the first wave of innovation is, is right around the Bitcoin protocol itself, which is a very simple, elegant protocol. It's meant to be simple. It's not meant to have a lot of additional layers baked into it. It's the simplicity that makes it powerful, that makes it extensible across multiple industries and for multiple purposes. Uh, so we work hard at the foundation to preserve that. Uh, and our chief scientist, Gavin Andreessen, who's the uh, lead developer of the open source project, works really, really hard to preserve that extensibility of the platform. Uh, and then on top of that, the kind of the second wave of innovation is this core infrastructure that needs to be built. So reliable exchanges where people can move value in and out of the Bitcoin ecosystem, right, which has largely been stifled by lack of people who can build regulated exchanges in the, in the U.S. currently. Um, there's the mining, quote unquote, community, which is really just a fancy way of saying payment processing. The people who secure the ledger and, and make transactions move across the ledger. There's merchant acquisition and merchant services. There's consumer services. And there are investor services, which allow people to create derivative markets and speculate to, to, to do price discovery throughout the, the system. So you have the second layer of infrastructure. That's what's being built right now today. Uh, on the horizon is this kind of wave three innovation. The innovation that happens when you think to yourself, what if all of that existed? What if all that wave two stuff existed? That, that you know, there's uh, really fast transactions, performant exchanges, uh, merchants are on board, consumers have uh, access to Bitcoin and can spend them easily. What can we build then? And that's where things get interesting. You have all sorts of unique P2P payment situations, uh, business to business transactions that are cross border in very interesting ways, uh, structured conditional payments that say, I will send you my manufacturer in China a payment, uh, and it will be held automatically in escrow by a a, a oracle or a bot or a piece of code that sits out there in the sky and looks for the customs slip to cross the border. And once the, the bill of lading through, comes through customs, it releases the payment automatically without any third party having to do anything about it. That solves a lot of problems. I mean, accounts receivable for manufacturers and, and sellers and, and, and cross-border transactions is a huge, huge loss. Uh, uh, and it's a big opportunity for entrepreneurs to solve a real problem uh, and create more uh, uh, liquidity throughout the uh, monetary system and, uh, and create uh, economic efficiencies and create real growth. Uh, so those are the really interesting things. Now what we're working on uh, at, at, um, at a protocol level is uh, something called version 0 0.9. So keep in mind also that Bitcoin is right now at version 0 0.8.6, so not even version 1. It's still, still a baby. Uh, like Google products, it's still, it's still in beta five years in. Um, sorry, Google people. Um, uh, so it's, it's, we're moving to version 0 0.9, which is also commonly referred to as the payment protocol. So what that does is it allows structured data to be placed within a transaction uh, in a way that's very machine readable. So people can append rich data to every transaction that happens across the network. And that data could be a smart contract, a conditional payment, an identity service. It could be any number of different things. Who knows what people will come up with. Uh, it also allows seller, um, uh, recipients to identify themselves in a secure way so that you know if you're sending your bitcoins to buy something at overstock.com that you're actually sending it to a Bitcoin address that's associated with overstock.com and some scammer or somebody doesn't spoof that address and put it in front of you. Um, it allows for return of funds so that you can automatically return funds if you don't want them. So you're not forced as a recipient to take Bitcoin if you don't want them. You can send them right back immediately. So if there's some data that you want appended to a transaction that isn't there, you can, you can ship it right back. Um, and it allows you to provide as a recipient a receipt 
essentially a piece of data back to the sender to let them know that you know this is they paid this thing this is what it was for etc so that's the that's at a protocol i think going to unlock quite a bit of this wave 3 innovation in conjunction with you know just the core infrastructure that needs to be built the the performance exchanges the, the the consumer services the merchant services things like that i think the biggest roadblock right now is on the exchange side and it's mostly not from the federal level it's at the state level just creating a uniform framework so people understand how to build something that is compliant. And I'll say, even with the most seasoned entrepreneurs and with the best advisors, it is still very, very difficult to understand when and where money transmission rules apply as the operator of a Bitcoin exchange. It's very difficult. And in fact, you're held strictly liable as an owner of one of those exchanges to know the rules, even though some of the states that we've talked to have admitted that they don't know how the rules apply. So it's, it's a tricky, tricky environment, and I think that there's a real need for some leadership, possibly from D.C., maybe from uh, you know, the Conference of State Bank Supervisors, maybe from FinCEN or some other government agency, to create a unified framework for these systems. These are Internet systems. They aren't brick-and-mortar systems, and kind of regulating them on this you know, Byzantine, state-by-state -state basis where everything is different. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense, and it puts us as a country at an economic disadvantage to uh, regions like the EU that do allow you to passport uh, between com uh, countries these types of licenses. Thanks. Thank you, Patrick. John? Thank you very much, and uh, I thought we'd be still talking about Justin Bieber's arrest, so most of my uh, <laughs> notes are sort of null and void now, but um, I wanted to just kind of run through briefly sort of what the committee that I work for, the Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs, has done related to this issue, what our chairman and ranking member, uh, Senators Carper and Coburn, have done uh, related to this issue, why we did it, um, sort of what we've learned briefly, and then maybe talk a little bit about sort of what the next steps might be for sort of our ongoing inquiry. So a little less than a year ago, um, Bitcoin, digital currencies in general, sort of popped up on our radar as a major emerging issue. Obviously, at this time, you got to think Silk Road was still very much uh, in play. Um, a number of uh, Silicon Valley investors and uh, sort of even some more traditional uh, financial institutions in New York were starting to sort of ask questions about it. But little or no attention had been paid to it uh, in Washington. And I think for good reason, Washington doesn't necessarily get a great reputation for being the most savvy uh, place in the entire world for tech policy. Um, but at the same time, the, the, the technology presented a number of concerns, risks, uh, potential vulnerabilities, and probably more than anything, just a knowledge gap. Um, so what we set out to do was sort of close that knowledge gap and uh, bring uh, agencies together as well as law enforcement. Um, Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs has dual responsibilities, obviously, with the Homeland Security piece, but also sort of taking um, what is a very big government and a very big country and the disparate parts of that government that have a lot of different roles and bringing them together to make sure that we're coordinating in a way that's um, both thoughtful and nimble and also meaningful. So that's what we set out to do, and, and as a part of that oversight and in, uh, as a part of that sort of formal inquiry, we sent uh, oversight letters to a number of relevant law enforcement and uh, regulatory agencies asking them essentially, what's your plan? Uh, what are you doing? Who are you talking to throughout government? Who are you talking to uh, that's outside of government, in either the tech or financial sectors, to try to inform sort of your worldview? and uh, come to the table and talk to us about it. And so uh, aside from those letters, we've also conducted at this point, I think over 40 or 50 interviews with stakeholders inside and outside of government, inside and outside of ac academics. Um, and um, then followed that up after we sort of pulled that uh, information together and, and held a hearing last November, uh, where we brought folks together again from both the government side and from private sector stakeholders to discuss this issue and sort of bring law enforcement and, um, and financial regulators to the table to say sort of what, what's your plan, what's being done? Um, are you concerned about this? Do you need resources or more authorities from Congress? And I think there's a few things that sort of shook out from that. For one, I think it was an opportunity for the first time for folks on the Hill to get in, in uh, uh, a primer on this um, in, in sort of a very real way. And a lot of folks at this table uh, helped contribute to that and, and were witnesses at that hearing. Um, I think it also was an opportunity for law enforcement, and, and I think this hearing happened a week or two after uh, the Silk Road bust, to show that you, know, you can't just use this technology uh, to get away with what you think you can get away with. 
I mean, arrogance and greed and stupidity are not the like sole bastion of Bitcoin or other digital currencies. It's just a tool that that folks will try and use to 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 put one over on 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 others. And I think uh, the Silk Road bust um, up until that point really proved to folks that this is not an anonymous protocol that you can just do whatever you want with. Um, that that uh, if you're going to use it for illicit activities, um, you will be caught. Um, I think it was also an opportunity for for Treasury and some other folks to talk about the guidance that they had put out, and and really FinCEN is uh, the sole sort of uh, leader at this point uh, on the regulator side to talk about sort of what they've done related to regulations and talk about how that's working, why they decided to do it, how they were informed in, in putting out what they put out, and um, really have that conversation sort of for the first time. Um, I think what's what's next for sort of our, you know our inquiry, which is still active and ongoing, is is continuing to sort of see what what shakes out. I mean, there are other outlier uh, sister regulatory agencies that have yet to weigh in. Um, I think the IRS is is one certainly that that folks want to hear from, and we're continuing to follow up with them. I think we'll expect to hear from from FinCEN, who at this point is engaged in. Uh, issuing what are called administrative rulings. So if you're an interested party, either a Bitcoin user or a Bitcoin business owner or entrepreneur of some sort, and you have a question about how your uh, business fits into their regulatory scheme, you essentially can send a letter to FinCEN asking, asking them how. And they will issue a letter which they will send to you personally, but then redact the information and then uh, post publicly. And those, uh, one went out just a few weeks ago involving mining, and I expect um, that uh, more of those will be coming out probably in the next few weeks and months. Um, I think another piece that, that's pretty crucial in this, and, and that one that really hasn't been cracked yet, um, is sort of the international cooperation piece. I mean, this is really a global phenomenon. I know the European Central Bank's report last year um, talked about sort of the importance of international cooperation and discussion about this. I think um, the, the more folks that I've talked to and the more I've seen, and especially on uh, some of the folks, the really smart folks that we have working in this government, whether it be in Treasury or, or in law enforcement, um, you know, we don't have to lose on this if this is going to be a competitive industry. Um, but I do think the trick is, is, and I think this is what Congress can really hopefully play a role in, and I know that's something that's very important to my boss, Chairman Carper, is he often talks about sort of how government can sort of, in terms of government policy, uh, steer the boat, not row the boat. Um, and I think that's, that's crucial with this. I mean, how do we bring folks to the table and have a dialogue, law enforcement regulators, business and, and entrepreneurs, to sort of nurture an environment that, that, uh, that sort of fosters innovation and entrepreneurship while also not allowing bad actors who want to just feed off greed and, and arrogance to, to take advantage of folks. And that's sort of a sweet spot, but I do think that's, a, that's an important role that Congress can play in sort of pushing that dialogue, and that's, I think, the role that the committee is going to continue to play. And I think um, the committee, uh, Chairman Carper, has uh, said that we will be issuing a majority staff report on our findings related to our inquiry. I expect that will probably be coming out in the next few months. And um, the, that's the sort of the work that we're continuing to do. So. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and take my prerogative as moderator and ask a few questions, and, and then I'll open it up for the f to the floor for some more. Uh, my first question is specifically for Patrick, but I'd be interested in see, hearing anybody else's responses as well. Uh, one of the things that you addressed was the opportunities to consumers that you thought Bitcoins represented. Uh, but there have been a number of alleged hacks or pyramid schemes associated with Bitcoin services that have caused reported losses in the millions of dollars. How do you see the community responding to those and making consumers feel more trusting of Bitcoin? Um, sure. So those things happen in a number of different contexts uh, beyond just Bitcoin. Um, and yeah, people will build Ponzi schemes wherever they can find suckers, unfortunately. And, uh, and in the early days, there were people in Bitcoin who fell for a Ponzi scheme and a scammer took advantage of the Bitcoin community. Um, and, and good for the SEC, they, they, they brought the person to justice or they were in the process of doing so. Um, and so all for the better. I think that's a, a good moment for Bitcoin. It's a good moment for the Bitcoin community. Again, it dispels this notion that somehow Bitcoin is superior to other payment methods for illegal activity. I mean, at this point in time, anybody who thinks that Bitcoin is better than another payment method like cash or money orders for illegal activity is really, really dumb. 
I mean, <laughs> to be blunt, um, uh, there have been enough uh, arrests already. Um, so, uh, and now when you talk about the hacks and things like that, those have happened. And generally speaking, uh, I think people are learning from it. Again, it's a very experimental technology, and most of that happened in a very experimental phase. Um, and you're seeing the industry evolve to new sets of uh, best practices and standards around how to hold Bitcoin on behalf of other people. One, if you're going to have a custodial account that holds Bitcoin on behalf of somebody else, you have a responsibility to those consumers to make them whole if your system is hacked or if you lose those Bitcoins, period. There's no question about that. Um, that is, there's, there, and there are already laws and rules and regulations on the book that stipulate that exact same thing. So there's nothing new about that. Secondly, there's an advantage to Bitcoin that cash doesn't have, and that's creating these new types of wallets where I can store my Bitcoin, and to, sorry to get too nerdy here, but it's called an M of N transaction. But what I'm really saying is that you can split up what are the private keys, the things that authenticate transactions, into a number of, of pieces that have to be reconstituted in a certain way before funds can be transacted. So I could store my Bitcoin on an online wallet, trust that they have one of three of the keys, two of which are needed to unlock those funds and create a transaction. So the service provider would only have one key. I would have a key, and then somebody I trust as a third party, a lawyer or somebody like that, or maybe a third party service provider, would have the third key. You need both, you need two of those three to make a transaction go. You can't do that with money today, right? You can only do that with Bitcoin. And what you've done is you've created a online account that holds funds for consumers that puts the consumers back in control and doesn't expose them to risk. The other thing that that, that brings to mind is the target breach, right? Unlike uh, with Bitcoin, when you go, how many times, uh, just by count, how many people have given away their personal information, credit card information to an online retailer? Or I should say, more than one, right? <laughs> there, yeah, I'm just going to assume that the people who didn't raise their hands are just full of it. Um, they, they, they mail their checks into Amazon in Seattle, right? Um, so, uh, and that's, that's a crazy system to think about it. I, every time I want to place an order online, I have to give them all of my personal identifiable information, and I have to give them essentially a pull account for my money, saying, here's a number, right, and you can pull money from me whenever you want. Of course hackers are going to go after that. You've centralized this giant, like, this, this giant, uh, you know, pot of gold right there for them. You know, the economics favor hackers in that scenario. With Bitcoin, you can change the economics for hacking, because what you can say is, it's a push transaction. You only need to know certain pieces of information about me given a certain transaction. If it's a low-value transaction, you probably don't need to know a whole lot about me. As the value goes up, the type of transaction changes, you might need more information. But I can be very, very specific in the type of information I give with every single transaction I make, and it's a push transaction, which means as a merchant, you get my money once. You don't get the ability, or to store on your servers, the ability to continue to take my money. So if a hacker wants to come after and do a target style breach in a Bitcoin world, they have to go and hack every single consumer's computer one by one. The economics just don't favor that type of attack. So I think there's a real advantage to using Bitcoin in a consumer e-commerce setting that credit cards can't match at the moment. I also think that when you think about Bitcoin security, you have to separate out the security of Bitcoin itself, the protocol, and just general computer security. Um, so to date, Bitcoin's uh, security has never been compromised. And I, I would <coughs> defer to Ed to tell me how secure you know, the <laughs> protocol is. But from my understanding, you can't um, easily or at all uh, counterfeit a Bitcoin. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about um, uh, Bitcoin uh, security. But then you have computer security. And so um, if a hacker can breach your computer security and steal the Word documents, your IP, your photos from your computer, and you happen to have Bitcoin there, you happen to have your private keys there, well, then they're going to be able to steal your, your, your Bitcoins as well. So let's, let's separate out those two things. There's computer security, and then there's Bitcoin uh, protocol security. And from what I can tell, Bitcoin protocol security has been pretty tight. Anyone else? 
So uh, my next question is specifically for Susan, but as with the last one, I'd be happy to have anybody else jump on in afterwards. Uh, you mentioned that you consult for a different in, uh, a digital currency type payment system called Ripple. Mm -hmm. Can you explain how that differs from Bitcoin and from other or digital currencies and how they're the same? Sure. So I think the part of it that interests me the most and that I think is, is um, maybe the most generalizable as well is that they, are, they have a currency exchange sort of built into the protocol so that uh, you can hold your local balances in dollars. And then just if I want to send, say, yen to someone else, I can, I can look out in the network and, the, and their protocol enables market makers as well as individuals to make bids for different currencies to exchange them. And so if I, want to, if I want to send yen to someone, I can see exactly how many yen I'm going to get for my dollar at the moment I ask the transaction to occur. So it can, it'll simultaneously clear a sequence of transactions. So say I have a, a local financial institution that's holding my dollars and that financial institution is plugged into the Ripple network. If I want to send someone yen, there'll be a transaction from my dollars to someone else who my, who my financial institution has chosen to trust, who's a market maker between dollars and XRP, the native currency. Then there may be another market maker who will make a transaction between XRP and yen, and that, and that market maker, you would look for one who is trusted by the, the institution of the person who wants to receive your yen. Okay? So it, there's not just yen on the system, but there's yen associated with particular institutions, and the institutions can choose who to trust. And as a consumer, I can confirm all three of those transactions simultaneously so I don't have to suffer any exchange rate risk. There's still bid-ask spreads that are set by the market makers, but there's no risk. I know exactly how many yen will go. And so, what the, so you, again, you might ask, well, what's the role of the XRP, the native digital currency in the middle? It's just a central node that connects everyone else. It connects the yen to market makers, to the dollar market makers. So you have fewer hops to get from one thing to another, and that, middle, that XRP hop is sort of risk-free. Um, and so what that's going to do is it's also going to encourage people to hold their local currency. And even though, as I mentioned, some of the initial interest in Bitcoin came from people who didn't want to hold their local currency. They had, you know, um, fears about central governments doing hyperinflation, which, you know, in the United States is less justified. Obviously, there's some countries where that is a legitimate fear. But there were people who, who just, for whatever reasons, didn't want to hold their local currency. Those people wanted to hold Bitcoin, but most consumers actually would be better off holding their local currency. Um, their local currency is what they get paid in, it's what they buy things in, and they really don't want to be subject to extra exchange rate risk. And so what this, what, one of the things that the Ripple Protocol does is it really encourages people to go ahead and hold their local currency or whatever other currency they want. They only use the, the digital currency as a rail, as a way to get from point A to point B. So in the Bitcoin world, you can do that by putting together an exchange with a transaction, and potentially a third party could, could create something similar. So with Ripple, it's built into the protocol. And I just want to, I think what's, what's kind of interesting, though, about the, the Ripple protocol is it really highlights that it's not about holding the currency. I mean, you can hold the currency, but it's not, that's not the only point of digital currency. It's not to say I'm, I'm hedging my, my, my fears about the, the peso by holding a, a currency, I'm using it as a rail. I think it's useful in general to distinguish between Bitcoin as a specific technology, Ripple as a specific technology, and the more general, broader idea of virtual currencies. That is, um, a system that lets you store and transmit um, value chits, as Susan said earlier, from uh, one person to another in purely digital form. Um, and uh, certainly, Bitcoin has a first mover advantage. It's popular and um, gets a lot of use. Um, but there are pros and cons of doing it 
of, uh, but there are detailed designs of each of these systems and there are pros and cons. You can say Bitcoin is more efficient than that one and this one enables certain kinds of functions that the other one doesn't allow and so on. I think we'll continue to see innovation in the technical details and the institutional details of how digital currencies are, are organized. Um, and, um, and that's an important part of the picture here as well. It may be that five years from now, we're not using Bitcoin, we're not using Ripple, but everything, everybody is using this fabulous new thing that Jerry invented tomorrow. Um, and um, so even if you're not a believer in Bitcoin or in Ripple or in any of these, digital currencies are a thing that's coming because they offer technical advantages such as the ability to transmit value very quickly across borders, as well as the ability to build new kinds of functionality um, that uh, is supported by a currency natively. For example, the ability, one of the things that, uh, that Bitcoin lets you do, for example, is a lim sort of limited escrow function. So if I want to pay a dollar to Jerry, but Andrea is going to hold it in escrow, I can create a kind of voucher to give to her, which she can pay back to me or give to Jerry, but do, do nothing else with. You can do that within the Bitcoin system in such a way that the system itself enforces that rule. That's a function that you can't do with traditional money. And this ability to invent new kinds of interactions which are enforced natively by the technology itself is something that traditional money has not had. And um, I think that's going to be a big area of innovation. Um, I think we can only really start to imagine the kinds of new functions which become possible once the door is open to this kind of self-enforcing contract or self-enforcing transaction. I totally agree, very well said. It's a phenomenon, um, not a specific uh, protocol. Yeah, I would just add that, yeah, like, like Ripple, there's Litecoin and Puricoin and Feathercoin and, you know, there's, there are a lot of coins. <laughs> I mean, there's a distinct power law at work, though, and, and Bitcoin certainly does have that first mover advantage, and that's what everybody is using right now. Uh, and building off of, um, I, but th there's also a spectrum amongst these coins, right? So you have like my Bank of America account, which is totally centralized digital currency, and it is digital currency whether you like it or not, sorry. It's a right to money that's sitting there, not actual money in my pocket, right? And then you have kind of what I call the, the quasi-decentralized currencies, which is Ripple, because there's some elements of centralization, which can be appealing. Uh, and then there's the purely decentralized, which is like, like Bitcoin, where there really is no third party uh, necessary or involved in, in distributing either the, the, the chits or in distributing how uh, transactions happen over the network. You never have to look at a central ledger or anything like that to, to match up against. Um, it's purely peer to peer. Uh, so there, there is, there's a lot of innovation. I know that one of the things we look at is, um, I, I know that Gavin and, and all, they, they, they view these as, as testing grounds, right? And if somebody builds something better in one of these, what we call altcoins, then that proves that there's a need for it, and maybe that gives it higher consideration for being a, a adopted or added into the Bitcoin protocol itself. Um, but generally, the idea is to keep the protocols as simple as possible so that people can build extensions on top of it. You know, if, if I could just add something, I mean, when we started sort of our work looking into this and sort of figuring out, is this a fad, is this just a flash in the pan, you know, the more folks we talk to, it's clear that whether it's Bitcoin or another protocol that sort of takes a market leader position, this idea um, is, is going to stick around because it just seems to make sense. Um, and if, if that's the case, then how do we make sure that we, again, sort of have a nimble and thoughtful policy, public policy, that doesn't um, just relegate it to, so only the folks that want to work in the shadows are using it to do whatever illicit activities they want to do, but to also allow the kind of folks that want to take a risk and take a bet um, and make some kind of value to the marketplace, give them an opportunity to do that too. Um, and so that's another reason, I think, uh, on top of the others, why we sort of pursued um, our work on this. Great, thanks so much, guys. And we are, we do have a very strict 3.50 leave time, so I'm gonna go ahead and open things up for a few audience questions. And it looks like Joe's already got his hand up over there. Joe Haas, CDT, um, another function or another altcoin that you haven't discussed at all are the anonymous virtual currencies, but maybe zero coin, zero cash. Uh, I'm wondering what you guys think about that. Is that so different to be alt, alt currency? Is, is, it, is it worrying? Is is that another yet, still yet another function 
keep the accountability of these systems, but um, remove some of the debt liability. Any panelist can take that. <laughs> so. So I'll start by saying that um, so ZeroCoin does not exist yet. It's it's vaporware. Um, I believe that Matthew Green will release it. Um, yeah. So it's a doesn't. Um, yeah, so it doesn't exist. Um, I think one thing that it will do, um, it will be a good test um, of Bitcoin in the following way. Uh, some folks say that the only value Bitcoin has is its uh, utility to folks who want to anonymize themselves, especially for illicit purposes. If that's the case, then when um, ZeroCoin is released, we should see a massive exodus from Bitcoin uh, uh, to ZeroCoin, a lot of value uh, moving over. So we'll see. I think that's going to be interesting. I, I'd love to hear what Ed has to say about the... Sure. Uh, just for background, ZeroCoin is a so-called altcoin, which means it's a different kind of digital currency um, that by design offers uh, much stronger untraceability for the participants. Um, it, it relies on some pretty complicated cryptography that the crypto community seems to think is correct. Um, but essentially, um, I could pay a zero coin to Joe and only put into the ledger essentially a statement that someone who actually owned a coin um, paid, made a payment um, and give a voucher which only Joe can redeem. And so it makes that public ledger much harder to follow. Um, so in, if it does become popular, it is a challenge to um, this argument that um, Bitcoin, at least, is uh, has a public ledger that's intelligible and is an aid to investigation. Um, we don't know whether Bitcoin will become popular. It's a paper design, as, as Jerry said. Um, but um, the technology exists, and um, someone maybe is likely to try to, uh, uh, to commercialize it. Maybe actually, but before we move on, you did mention briefly about anonymity. I think that in the current, maybe just to flesh that out a little bit more, I mean, in the current Bitcoin system, the Ripple system and all these things, I mean, these are public ledgers. So in fact, um, they really have less anonymity than cash in a lot of ways. The dollar bill doesn't have a record of where it went from. And so a number of computer science researchers and also I've done a bit of this, you can, you can take the, the blockchain, the, the public log of Bitcoin and sort of identify groups of addresses that look like individuals in, and you can sort of, to a certain extent, track transactions. So it's actually probably would be preferred by you know, security agencies to pure cash or scribble down pieces of paper in somebody's pocket in terms of, there, at least there's some hope of tracing it, although, you know, a very sophisticated criminal can try to, you know, make that harder. So in some sense, you know, the digital world leaves traces <laughs> um, in a way that sometimes the physical world does not, and, and it can be mined, you know, in some sense much more easily. So I just, again, sorry, I'll go back to the audience here. Uh, I know we've had some NSA panels today, so I think we'll get a good response. Who, who here in this room thinks that they're anonymous on the internet? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, you know, you just, you, you leave footprints behind when you use these networks. There's a permanent trail. You're less anonymous using Bitcoin than you are just surfing the internet. So, you know. Smart computer scientists, smart data miners can figure out who these people are, generally speaking. You leak identity in a number of different ways through these transactions. It's not so much a problem that Bitcoin is anonymous for criminal purposes. As we've seen, it's a pretty terrible medium of exchange for criminal activity. It may, in fact, be a consumer protection problem that Bitcoin isn't anonymous or private enough. Right? I get paid my salary in Bitcoin and I'm scared to think that Susan could probably figure out exactly how much I make. Um, so without knowing any more than just me saying that, now she's looking at her computer. So, <laughs> um, so uh, I think that there's another worry at play, which is you know, making sure that there's transparency in the right places and opacity in the right places. Right? We don't need internet marketers, no offense to the internet marketers. Uh, knowing exactly how much I make, everything I buy all the time in a real-time feed. That's not a very appealing system. Yeah, and being a congressional staffer, uh, our salaries are public, so I know how you <laughs> feel. 
Um, but I would just say, you know, we talk to law enforcement all the time, um, and we've got some of the smartest people in government working in a lot of these agencies, uh, whether it be FBI and others. And, um, you know, I know that they're monitoring this, um, but I think they've got a pretty good track record at this point of, of um, finding folks that are using these systems to conduct illicit activities. So. Great. And it looks like we have another question. I was talking at lunch to someone who pays his rent in bitcoins. <laughs> I mean, I think that may be the wrong question. Um, you know, the United States has pretty good financial systems. Um, a lot of our country is banked. Um, you know, we have had, we do have, mo you know, non-trivial fees for deb debit cards and credit cards and so on. But you know, you, you can basically do your daily business reasonably well in this country. So that's one of the reasons that I emphasized in my opening remarks, sort of new use cases, things that haven't been served well, <clears throat> small value transactions and things like that. So yes, you can pay your rent in Bitcoins, but it was probably, you, you probably had a pretty good way to pay your rent already. Um, and so the improvement to you is not so great. But, you know, in some parts of the world, most people are unbanked. Um, you know, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has banking the world's poor as one of their top priorities, and that's because being unbanked really limits your ability to do lots of things, um, save and access financial market, other things that come through financial markets. So I would look to, yes, you know, maybe I would think of these groceries and the rent as sort of, well, once you're using it to do other things, then maybe there's a slightly lower transaction cost to doing the things you already do using digital currencies, but it won't directly affect you. Or, you know, maybe some, somebody comes in and competes with the credit cards that has just a lower cost structure and thus lower fees because they're using digital currency as a backbone. But as a consumer, you might be completely abstracted from that. Or maybe you would get bigger cashbacks or other kinds of rewards because their cost structure is lower. So... <clears throat> I don't know that we will necessarily be using Bitcoin for those kinds of transactions. Um, you know, Clayton Christensen, uh, when he talks about disruptive technologies, one of the things that he identifies as being associated with disruptive technologies is that when they emerge, they are much worse. They're not as useful as the existing um, incumbent, but they're cheaper. Um, and it takes a while for somebody to discover what it's good for. Uh, so when the, think about PCs, when PCs first emerge, again, hobbyists, uh, developing them. Um, the, the gold standard were uh, mainframes and mini computers, and PCs just could not hold a candle to these. So why would you ever want to use them, right? It's kind of the same question you're asking now. Why would anybody use it in this way? But um, soon enough, somebody invented a killer app, which was the spreadsheet, Lotus123. And then it, you know, uh, accountants all around the country and uh, um, uh, uh, accounting departments needed to have PCs. And then pretty soon, people started realizing what you could do with a PC, and today you ask yourself, why would you need a mainframe, right? Um, so I think we don't know yet what that killer app will be that Bitcoin enables. Um, and as we were mentioning, it's, it's not just payments. Payments is, is the 1.0 application of Bitcoin. The other applications are distributed stock exchanges, distributed um, uh, security uh, uh, derivative markets. You can imagine assurance contracts, right? So what, essentially what Kickstarter does today could be done in a decentralized fashion uh, on Bitcoin. So we don't know. Yeah, and I would say, you know, it's, it's always interesting because people talk about Bitcoin. It's like electronic cash, right? Which in some ways, that's a good analogy. Uh, the other industry that used to make that analogy was the credit card companies. <laughs> if you go back and look at their advertising campaigns through the 60s and 70s, it, their slogan was, if I might misquote it, but their slogan was, just like cash, right? So when credit cards were introduced... It took a long, it took decades for people to realize that these were useful in everyday transactions. Why would I use a credit card? I've got these, you know, paper bills in my pocket and they seem to do just fine. Like there's no cost to it. I just walk in and I buy my coffee, no problem, right? So it does, it takes time. And, and, and now we don't think of credit cards like cash. We think of them as this vehicle for payment and, and credit and facilitating e-commerce and all those other things. Bitcoin is probably going to be better than that for some applications and worse than others. 
uh, credit cards have sort of a sweet spot, right, between about, I'd say, 10 and, you know, $2,000. If you want to buy something that's valued between 10 and $2,000, credit cards are great. If you want to buy something that's a dollar, credit cards suck, especially for merchants. About 33% of that dollar, if not more, goes to the payment processor. That's a 33% hit for the merchant every time you use a credit card on $1 transaction, which is why you see not much innovation in micropayments, right? And for macro payments, if you want to buy a car, has anybody here bought a car on a credit card? No, no one buys cars on credit cards. I don't think a car dealer would take it. You think they're going to give up 2.75% of that deal to the credit card company? No way. No way. They'd take Bitcoin. I know a car dealer that takes Bitcoin right now. So... With, with Bitcoin or with Bitcoin or credit card? No, credit card. Yeah, th maybe they'll take Bitcoin. You should give them a try. <laughs> if you paid them a year ago, they would have made out on it. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we're going to have to cut things off here because the next panel starts in four minutes in this room. But if you have more questions, I encourage you to harass our panelists as they exit the room. <laughs>